Hey, 42 here. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed, but newborn humans are, on the whole, utterly useless. A baby giraffe can walk within half an hour of it being born. Only minutes after hatching, turtles are able to crawl down an entire beach and then swim away into the ocean. Depending on the species, it can take as little as two weeks for a bird to be able to fly. Not walk, fly. Our species, on the other hand, spends the first thousand hours of our lives doing absolutely nothing. We're completely helpless. Faced with some form of existential threat, our best defense is to shit ourselves. It's all a little embarrassing, really. To make matters even more challenging, one in 10 humans are born prematurely, which can dramatically increase the difficulties they need to overcome as infants. Nowadays, many of these issues are treatable and miraculously, a child born a full three months early has a 90% chance of survival. But it wasn't always this way. A hundred years ago, if your baby was born prematurely, things were bleak. In fact, there was pretty much only one thing you could do to give them any chance of surviving at all. Take them to the carnival. If you visited New York in the early part of the 20th century, the place to go for some laughs was Coney Island, at the time the largest entertainment area in the United States, with millions of visitors every year and three separate amusement parks. Coney Island was a chaotic blend of hot dog stands, roller coaster rides, animal exhibitions, <laughs> sideshows, and displays of the weird and the wonderful. People came to be entertained and amazed by everything from bearded ladies to the latest advances in electrical lighting. But nestled in the middle of this madness was a strange blend of science and spectacle, an exhibit called the Infantorium, made up of a collection of glass incubators displaying premature human babies. Visitors paid 25 cents to enter the sterile environment, staffed by a team of qualified nurses, all dressed up in white. That all sounds pretty weird, but despite being located in the middle of an amusement park, the Infantorium was probably the most advanced neonatal care unit in the entire country. The man responsible for creating this bizarre infant oasis was Dr. Martin Cooney, a Prussian immigrant who began his career in Europe in the late 19th century before moving to the United States. In those days, there was very little medical understanding of how to treat a baby born prematurely. Preemies, as they were called, were basically wrapped up warm and then their parents were left to hope for the best. But the best was seldom the result. Death rates amongst premature babies were extremely high. Then, in the 1880s, a French obstetrician by the name of Etienne Tarnier had a flash of insight after a visit to Paris Zoo. There, he noticed the incubation chambers used to keep eggs warm until they hatched. And he decided to build his own child hatchery using a similar approach. These incubators were of a fairly basic design, intended to roughly mimic the conditions of a mother's uterus, with the idea being that the babies within could continue to grow as though they'd never left the womb. Tarnier's work was rejected by mainstream medical establishment as pseudoscience, which was a bit rich, considering that around the same time, the accepted treatment for chickenpox was to take laxatives. But another French doctor, Pierre Boudin, was a passionate supporter of Tarnier's work and decided the best way to get the word out was some direct marketing. At the Berlin World's Fair in 1896, Boudin displayed six premature babies in glass incubation chambers to an astonished public, and the exhibit turned out to be a runaway success. The man who helped Boudon achieve those results was his student, Martin Cooney, who saw the chance to take mm. this technology yes. to a much wider audience. 
Over the next few years, he featured his baby display at fairs, exhibitions, and world expos in London, Paris, Omaha, New York, Portland, Mexico City, Rio de Janeiro, Denver, San Francisco, Chicago, and Atlantic City. But it was Coney Island that was destined to become the Infantorium spiritual home. And in 1903, Cooney established a permanent exhibition there that would remain for 40 years. Cooney's methods were unconventional, but progressive. Babies were either fed using a unique feeding technique through the nose or by wet nurses, who in turn were cooked for by dedicated chefs to ensure they got the right nutrition. Nurses weren't allowed to smoke, eat junk food, or drink alcohol. Cooney also insisted that the working environment for all nurses was as relaxing as possible, believing that stress had a negative impact on their performance and the quality of care they offered the babies. Contrary to some popular thinking at the time, nurses were encouraged to take the babies out of their incubators and cuddle them in the belief that human touch helped them recover more quickly. Obviously, not everyone saw things Cooney's way. Putting the babies under his care on display in the middle of a theme park, quite understandably, triggered outcries from child protection groups who said Cooney was exploiting the babies and their parents. Whilst one of the major medical journals at the time condemned him for using the infantorium as a thinly veiled excuse to line his own pockets. There was also that not insignificant issue that there wasn't actually any evidence Cooney was even a real doctor. He claimed to have studied medicine in Leipzig, Germany, but no one was ever able to find records to prove it. So, was this man really just a fraud, cynically using vulnerable children as marketing tools to fleece cash from the gullible and the curious? Well, the results say no. Cooney may not have been a certified medical doctor, and yeah, he may have set up his childcare facility next door to the Elephant Man, but he clearly got something right. At a time when actual doctors and real hospitals failed to save 90% of preterm infants, a remarkable 90% of the babies entrusted to Cooney's care survived. It's estimated he and his nurses saved the lives of as many as 7,000 yes. premature babies over the first half of the 20th century. And just in case there were any lingering doubts about his motives, it turns out Cooney never charged the parents a single cent. It was definitely pretty unorthodox to put premature babies on display whilst they were being nursed back to health. But by charging the public to see the exhibition, Cooney was able to make enough money to cover all the costs of caring for the children while still paying his nurses a decent wage. Initially, the people who benefited the most from it were the poor, unable to afford any kind of private medical treatment, and with so few public hospitals equipped with incubators, disadvantaged parents were able to access free care at Cooney's Infantorium. With severely premature babies, that was literally the difference between life and death. Even during the Great Depression of the 1930s, when poverty skyrocketed, Cooney's treatments remained free, saving thousands of lives. On its own, the story of Martin Cooney and the many babies he saved would be extraordinary. But what really makes it stand out is the cultural climate that surrounded it. In America, the start of the 20th century saw the rise of eugenics, a belief in the need to weed out the weak or unworthy from the human population, leaving behind a pristine gene pool of humans that were smart, strong, and good-looking. This type of thinking led to compulsory sterilization laws being introduced in 30 US states. Under these laws, tens of thousands of Americans, particularly those of ethnic minorities, were forcibly sterilized in order to eliminate so-called undesirable characteristics from the population. Through the warped lens of eugenics, 
premature babies who were naturally weaker and sicklier than their <laughs> full-term peers were essentially considered a liability to the human race. Articles in medical journals at the time condemned Cooney's attempts to save these babies, saying they would pass on their deficiencies, deformities and vices to the next generation. Fortunately, the popularity of eugenics slowly died out by the middle part of the 20th century, when it became a favourite pastime of a little gang of psychopaths called the Nazis. But people like Martin Cooney had resisted it all the way through. At the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, Cooney shared an exhibition space with a eugenics organisation committed to preventing what it called undesirable births. One of the publicity campaigns for the eugenicists involved hosting pageants called Better Baby Contests, designed to showcase the healthiest and most beautiful babies around. In a classic backfire, one of these Better Baby winners tragically died of tuberculosis a few months after the fair. On the other hand, an infant that had been brought to Dr. Coney in a shoebox around the same time went on to live to 80 years old. Despite his amazing results in childcare, Cooney's reputation was always a little sketchy. Hardly surprising, given his inability to prove that he was actually a qualified doctor. The medical establishment constantly criticised the fact that his infantorium was located amongst animal exhibits and peep shows, apparently making it physically and morally unhygienic. Cooney's case wasn't helped by the imposter shows that began popping up around the United States. Many of these exhibitions copied Cooney's model of putting live babies on display, but didn't deliver the same levels of cleanliness and medical treatment. Some even used perfectly healthy babies who were not premature at all, sparking fears that a side industry of baby production would grow with parents hiring out their children to carnival sideshows. That never came to pass, but in 1911, Cooney's credibility took a major blow when a fire broke out at one of the Coney Island entertainment centers. All the infants were rescued, but the incident convinced many that it probably wasn't a great idea to have babies hanging around in amusement parks after all. Yeah, maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. Despite the skepticism, Cooney's undeniably brilliant results did eventually win over much of the medical community, with local physicians entrusting their own patients, whose babies were born prematurely, to him. Today, Coney is seen as one of the pioneers of early infant care, someone who publicised premature births at a time when mainstream science refused to talk about them, and a courageous opponent of the eugenics movement. Despite being a little bit dodgy, he saved thousands of lives and gave hope to people who couldn't afford medical care for their children. Plus, he sported a pretty decent moustache, so in my book, he's a bit of a hero. Thanks for watching.